evening, everybody. Welcome to the School of Global Policy and Strategy and to uh, one of the gems of the school, the 21st Century China Center. Uh, tonight, we are celebrating uh, one of the people who helped build the school's uh, commitment to China and uh, helped the school elevate its game, so to speak, on a global stage. And that is the late Ambassador Robert Ellsworth. Uh, Bob Ellsworth served as a member of the International Advisory Board of this school for many years until he passed. And he was one of the principal movers in having the school decide that if its desire and DNA was to be uh, foremost among graduate schools in the country in work on the Pacific region, which we define simply as Asia and the Americas, that we had to be preeminent in the study and teaching and service in regards to China and the US-China relationship. Um, we thought it only fitting that this capstone event of each year of public engagement in the great conversation about China and the world should be named after Bob Ellsworth. And so it's with real delight that uh, Susan Shirk, as the leader of 21st Century China, and I uh, welcome you all tonight. And especially, I'd like to welcome to the podium the Reverend Eleanor Ellsworth to say a couple of words about Bob Ellsworth. Eleanor, please join us. This has to come down. <laughs> thank you, Peter. My pleasure today is simply to thank everybody for being here, for braving the cool, cool weather that was very unexpected, uh, to say the least. But I'm certain that we're going to have an engaging and a stimulating talk. I know we're all going to look forward to it. And I'm very, very, very pleased to meet for the first time our speaker whom Susan will introduce later on. Just reiterating something that Peter said about Bob being really committed to this school and how much he enjoyed the association of being part of the school. Several of you earlier today said something about that, how much you enjoy being part of this place. And clearly, Bob was a leader of the pack of being really, really pleased with what not only the dean was doing, but the students and the faculty and the staff, and that continues. So I know he applauds from afar what the school is doing today. Peter, you should be mighty proud. I wanna thank you also for honoring Bob and continuing to do so, and continuing to honor what contributions he was able to make to the school. I'd like to especially thank Professor Susan Shirk Dr. Lei Wang, where are you, Guang? There you go. And also Dean Peter Cowie for the admirable work that they do. And Sam Toy, where are you? Sam? All kinds of work behind the scenes I would like to thank. And I would especially like to thank our most generous Dr. Zhiwai Li, who is here from Shanghai, for all his wonderful support for these lectures. Now, my dear friend, Susan Shirk, and Bob's dear friend, would you like to come and introduce our speaker? Thank you. Well, this is always such a wonderful event because it reminds us how much we all benefited from and enjoyed so much Bob Ellsworth's involvement with the School of Global Policy and Strategy. Um, he himself was a great statesman politician who uh, was passionately concerned with international affairs and maintaining American leadership and global peace. So, uh, I know he would be particularly pleased to have this year's Ellsworth speaker, Danny Russell, here with us today. 
I know uh, Danny Russell is now the Vice President at the Asia Society Policy Institute in New York. Um, after leaving the Foreign Service, like many other uh, diplomats, American diplomats over the past few years, um, he, when he retired, his last post was this very important post in American foreign policy of Assistant Secretary of East Asia and the Pacific. Before that, uh, in the Obama administration, he was also the Senior Director for Asia at the National Security Council. So as you can see, he was the one of the architects, if not the main architect, of the, uh, the pivot uh, to Asia and the effort to strengthen U.S. leadership in Asia. Uh, I got to know Danny when I was in government in the second Clinton administration at the time. He was the chief of staff of another one of our great American diplomats, Tom Pickering, who was Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. And Danny actually worked for Tom at the United Nations when he was ambassador to the United Nations, as well as when he came back to be Under Secretary for Political Affairs, which, as many of you know, is really in some ways, the core job in the State Department of leading all the regional bureaus. And Danny, as chief of staff, was you know the person really on the front line working with all the regional bureaus. Now, it seemed to me that he spent all his time with me and my colleagues in the Asia Bureau because there was a lot to be done. And uh, so anyway, he inherited uh, by learning uh, the style of Tom Pickering, which was of a real statesman, strategist, and implementer of policy who also had a wonderful sense of humor. And Danny is well known in Washington for having a great sense of humor, which really comes in handy for a diplomat. Um, Today, he's going to be talking with us uh, about Asia as a region, the countries in Asia, and how they are adapting to the deterioration in U.S.-China relations and the way China and the U.S. are behaving in the region at the present time and how uh, they have to cope with this new situation and what its long-term ramifications will be. So I look, very much look forward to what Danny has to say. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Susan, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Dean Cowie, and thank you in particular, uh, Reverend Ellsworth, for uh, this opportunity and for your remarks. It's a pleasure for me to be back at UC San Diego, to be here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy and the 21st Century China Center. And it really is an honor to uh, deliver the Robert F. Ellsworth Memorial Lecture, particularly since I'm following in the footsteps not of Tom Pickering, but of so many esteemed uh, colleagues and, and mentors of, of mine. So at, literally, at this moment, the day has dawned in Beijing, June 4th, 2019, 30 years to the day, practically to the hour of the time that the People's Liberation Army opened fire on its own citizens on student uh, protesters in Tiananmen Square, and in so doing, decisively set China on the uh, course of political suppression uh, and of authoritarian control by the Communist Party that continues uh, to this day. And it's fair to say that China's current leader, Xi Jinping, has really doubled down on uh, Deng Xiaoping's fateful choice 30 years ago 
in other words, to prioritize Communist Party control and tough-minded enforcement, both of ideology, uh, but also public order. Well, what's so profoundly different about today's China, about Xi Jinping's China from Deng Xiaoping's situation 30 years ago, is the wealth, the power, and the extraordinary array of tools that Xi Jinping has at his disposal to sustain party control, to stifle political expression, to elevate China's status, to pursue the China dream, the rejuvenation of the China's Chinese nation. Domestically, you see the application of artificial intelligence in service of internal security, what I call big brother meets big data. But it's not a joke. It's for real, and it has long-term implications. Outside of China, you see the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, this infrastructure and uh, development, which is uh, really a stunning use of China's excess capacity, its extra steel, concrete, labor, foreign reserves, that's put in service of Chinese economic and Chinese geostrategic goals. So the rapid growth of China along several different lines of national power is one of two major trends that I see as driving change in the Asia Pacific region and, and beyond, frankly. The second trend is the shift in American politics and American policies. And it's a shift in a direction that weakens America's perceived commitment both to the region and to our historic values. So this pair of developments, these twin currents, have spawned a process of adaptation by third countries in the region that combines hedging with other more consequential and long-lasting structural changes. So look, every American administration since World War II, including the current one, has acknowledged the importance of the Asia-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific region to America's economic and security interests. You know, we're talking about a market of something like 4.5 billion people, uh, which over the last few years has supplied nearly two-thirds of global growth, constitutes some 40% of global GDP. America's security interests in that region are driven by the importance of keeping markets open and stable. Uh, driven by the threat from North Korea, driven by the challenge uh, of a near peer China, uh, and driven by destabilizing threats, you know, ranging from violent extremism to pandemics uh, to natural disasters. Historically, it's been American hard and soft power, diplomacy, private sector engagement, that have been the things that strengthened Washington's hand over the decades in setting standards, in setting rules that have facilitated economic growth and have advanced liberal democratic values. And as Susan alluded to, I'm proud to have been part of the Obama administration, which really increased, measurably increased American engagement in the region and, and bolstered trust in America through a policy of, of rebalancing that championed the rule of law, that championed universal rights, democratic institutions, good governance, innovation, entrepreneurship, environmental responsibility. But at the same time, geography and demographics are always gonna dictate that China will have considerable clout in Asia, notwithstanding the Middle Kingdom's occasional periods of weakness or introversion. Today, China is the largest trading partner of nearly every country in Asia. In the past few years, China has either reached or has upgraded free trade agreements with 
the 10 ASEAN countries in Southeast Asia with Australia, Singapore, New Zealand, South Korea. China has poured hundreds of billions of dollars of investments into the region over the last decade, including the Belt and Road Initiative that I mentioned. The Chinese diaspora throughout the region numbers something like 30 million people, many of whom retain family connections, cultural connections, economic links to China. Record numbers of big spending Chinese tourists now have fanned out throughout Asia. Chinese brands like Tencent or Alibaba have carved out huge market share and apps like WeChat dominate the region's smartphones. Xi Jinping has departed from the famous hide and bide orthodoxy of Deng Xiaoping and is working overtly to build a position of decisive regional influence for China. And Xi Jinping's occasional doctrine that Asian problems can be solved by the Asians themselves has been buttressed by his own very activist diplomacy. Just in his first term in office, his first five years, Xi Jinping visited nearly every single country in South Asia, Central Asia, and East Asia, and hosted their leaders in Beijing in return. China's military budget has increased at least five-fold over the last decade and is now roughly equal to the combined defense budgets of Japan plus South Korea plus Taiwan. It's really massive shipbuilding uh, and paramilitary shipbuilding campaign, along with its reclaimed island outposts in the, Spratly, uh, in the Spratlys and in the Paracels. These things allow China to project unprecedented power throughout the South China Sea. And a stronger and more activist China is also altering the multilateral equation in the region as well. Because there are these new China-centric institutions uh, being built, like the AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and the BRICS New Development Bank, that are emerging as well-funded alternatives to US-dominated organizations. And China has convened a lot of homegrown conferences, like the Belt and Road Forum, uh, and like Asia's answer to Davos, the Boao Forum. And it doesn't stop there, because Xi Jinping himself, as a, as a leader and as a diplomat, has really upped his game, up China's game, in forums like APEC, or the G20, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And on top of that, uh, he's convened world leaders to many new platforms. Uh, the Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, this is a trade initiative that China has been championing for years. It includes 16 other Asia, Asian and Pacific countries. It's now gaining some momentum after years of delay. So the landscape of China is altering. And it, it's even inching a little bit closer to what uncomfortably looks like a sphere of influence. On the other side of the Pacific, though, on this side, you have more or less the inverse of that. Because America first is just not a banner that other countries can rally around. The, so the administration's pronouncement of a new free and open Indo-Pacific sounded pretty good as a policy to the countries in the region. In fact, it sounded quite similar to the Obama-era rebalance or pivot. But after two years, it's come to be seen mostly as paying lip service, not a real policy but lip service infused with a, a very strident anti-China tone to it. My Asian friends and former counterparts, I think, are all troubled by the willingness of the administration to jettison international agreements and treaties. So 
the withdrawal from TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord, withdrawal from the Iran deal, withdrawal from the INF Treaty, these have all taken a toll on US credibility. And allies are distressed to be labeled as free riders. They're alarmed by President Trump's stated desire to withdraw troops from Korea because as he put it, Asia is not our neighborhood. And polling in the last few years shows very clearly a, a steep drop in confidence and approval of US leadership among allies and a drop in confidence that the US is gonna be willing to honor its defense commitments. And on top of that, we see serious disconnects between President Trump and uh, his national security team. And what I hear constantly is uh, concern that not only does the president make important decisions without consulting them, our allies, he makes important decisions without even consulting his own national security team. The economic dimension, though, is arguably more troubling to Asian partners. President Trump's fondness for tariffs, his penchant for kind of zero-sum approach to trade, his apparent contempt for multilateralism, his use of national security provisions in US trade law, it's called Section 232, to go after allies like Japan and Canada. These things are not well received in the region. And meanwhile, and not surprisingly, China has been able to uh, opportunistically exploit some of the features and effects of America First. At APEC in 2017, while Xi Jinping was championing multilateralism, he issued a ringing defense of the free and open global system. Susan, I don't know how you say chutzpah in Chinese, but this would be the, the word for it. So with, while this is going on in, in, in the speech given by Xi Jinping, President Trump used that summit to rail against the WTO and to champion American sovereignty, not the global trading system. That was 2017. In 2018, President Trump didn't even show up. The problem is not that the Chinese or the Chinese Communist Party is so diabolically clever. Beijing's overreach and missteps are notorious. The problem is not that countries in the region necessarily give that much credence to Chinese rhetoric. You know, you get a little bit jaded living next door to China after a millennium or two. <laughs> the issue is you can't beat something with nothing. And then there's the US-China trade war. Now, it's true that most of China's neighbors are either openly or secretly pleased to see the United States take on objectionable behavior by China, the kind of objectionable behavior that Vice President Pence and other officials have outlined in a lot of public speeches. And it's also true that there are certain net positives, some benefits, at least in the short term, for countries like in Southeast Asia from the US-China trade war because trade flows are redirected, more companies may relocate from China in order to sidestep tariffs. That's short term, but bigger picture and longer term, the US-China trade war is a huge threat to Asian economies and Asian societies. The Asia Development Bank, the World Bank have already lowered growth forecasts for the region as a result of previous rounds of tariffs. And given the supply chain structure, South Korea, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, these countries that produce components for Chinese products are really gonna feel the pain soon. And beyond security competition, beyond trade and technology disputes, the rapid deterioration of relations between uh, the two major powers in the Asia Pacific region 
U.S. and China is destabilizing, is roiling the region. The near universal view among all of the Asian partners and counterparts that I talk to is that the U.S.-China rivalry, strategic rivalry, is not going to end well for anybody. What they want is connectivity, not decoupling. And in particular, Asian friends for years have been warning that they don't want to be forced to choose between China and the United States. And I'm increasingly convinced that they are not going to make that choice. Instead, they are going to continue to maneuver to try to have it both ways. You know, very few countries are really aligning themselves sort of Cold War style with one bloc or with the other. Now, it's true there's an increasing deference to Chinese policy preferences. It's true there's a tendency to go along to get along. But you're not really seeing what is called bandwagoning with China. Instead, Asia is adapting to a stronger, wealthier, more assertive China and to an arguably uh, weaker and less dependable America. And they're adapting through new arrangements, new institutions, and through strategies that I would call adaptation. Now, my brother and sister are both uh, biologists, so um, I, I know that in science, adaptation is the development of a behavior that allows an organism to survive better in its environment. And countries in Asia are adapting to changes in their geostrategic environment, their ecosystem, individually and collectively. They're adjusting in order to safeguard their own interests in the face of these shifting power dynamics. And I think I see three types of behavior, three coping mechanisms. And in the spirit of alliteration, I'll call them um, deference, duality, and diversification. So what I mean by that is this. What we see deference when countries act to accommodate what China requires of them, China's priorities. And sometimes they will show that deference at the expense of their relations with the US, sometimes not. And China's readiness to use its considerable economic leverage helps drive the calculation on the part of many of these smaller countries that, hey, the better part of valor is to go along, is to acquiesce. So Cambodia is the poster child for deference and has a record of egregiously serving as China's proxy within ASEAN to protect, to protect Beijing from criticism over its actions in the South China Sea, for example. And there's no more dramatic shift uh, towards accommodation than what we saw in the Philippines after uh, President Duterte took over and, and pivoted to China. Uh, and from that accommodation, Beijing has gained territorial and defense and economic and political concessions from a US treaty ally. The second, the duality, uh, I just mean that uh, we see Asian countries following uh, balancing strategies to profit from their relationship with each of the two major powers without paying a price, without getting caught in the crossfire. Singapore, for example, has made this an absolute art form, and they're pretty good at it. It's not surprising for a small city-state that's so dependent on trade. But Vietnam, uh, China's socialist brother, as well as China's historic bitter enemy, actively practices kind of duality. It uses, on the one hand, party-to-party -party channels to strengthen ties and to lower tensions with Beijing, even while allowing an aircraft carrier to dock at Da Nang Harbor for the very first time since the Vietnam War. You see Indian uh, Prime Minister Modi 
set aside really sharp territorial disputes and strategic misgivings uh, towards China to declare last year that he had reset the relationship with China and gushingly tweet about his wonderful meeting with Xi Jinping at the G20. And while the prevailing pattern in Asia seems to be that uh, you know, the relationship with Beijing skews towards the economic side, the relationship with Washington skews towards the security side, as China's military footprint grows, as China's arms exports grow, and as US allies are demeaned as just free riders, that paradigm has started to shift. But I'll come back to that, because there's a third trend, the third D that I mentioned that should concern us, which is an emerging power of diversification. And I'll throw in a bonus fourth D, divestiture. It means that we're seeing countries scale back their reliance on the United States and instead turn to other relationships and other arrangements to compensate. And not all of those include China. So the director of national intelligence, now Dan Coates, said it straight out recently in his annual threat assessment to Congress. He said, quote, US allies and partners are seeking greater independence from Washington in response to their perception of changing US policies on security and trade, and they're becoming more open to new and uh, new bilateral and new multilateral partnerships. He just said it. And the shift fuels regional institutions that don't include the US. The AIIB, the BRICS Bank, the Belt and Road Forum, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. This is a new multilateralism with Chinese characteristics. And it relegates America to an outsider role, or, or worse. The ASEANs have been negotiating with China over the South China Sea for 16 or 17 years, at least. Last year, they agreed on a draft code of conduct for the South China Sea. Not only does that draft not even mention the law of the sea or the tribunal decision that ruled against China. But the draft restricts any of the 10 ASEAN countries from conducting joint military exercises with countries from outside the Asia region. Guess who that's referring to? So, so much for a free and open Indo-Pacific. Even our closest allies are diversifying their military procurement. They're conducting exercises without the United States, and they're bolstering their own indigenous defense capabilities. Japan, a country I know very well, has a defense doctrine that is rooted in the centrality of the alliance with the United States. But Japan is accelerating its push for its own strike capability independent of the United States. Think about this. The American president tells the press after meeting a North Korean official that he'd like to pull US troops out of Asia because allies are free riders who are not parent paying their way and because that's not our neighborhood. Think about it. Just last month, North Korea followed two volleys of ballistic missiles into the Sea of Japan. The US president slaps down his national security advisor for admitting that North Korea had violated UN Security Council resolutions. And standing on Japanese soil, standing next to the prime minister of Japan, the president says, the launches don't bother him. The message being, well, that's because the missiles can only reach Japan and South Korea. They can't reach the United States. So small wonder that there's a growing consensus in Japan that 
the country now needs to have its own military options. But the most striking example of diversification and divestiture, the most striking example, the evidence that America has become perceived as an unreliable partner, at least in the eyes of some of its friends, is the trade deal formerly known as TPP. So if you look at what happened to that deal after President Trump withdrew from the TPP on day three of his presidency, you'll see a very good example of the iterative nature of adaptation. So the first reaction of the 11 trading partners was that this agreement is meaningless if the United States is not part of it. And they all went to work trying to persuade various Americans, officials, and non-officials to change President Trump's mind. And that didn't work. After that, most of the TPP countries hoped that somehow the agreement could be sort of cryogenically frozen in li liquid nitrogen until that moment when America came back to its senses and then it would be just add water and, and reconstitute it as the TPP. That didn't happen. Quickly, they began to adapt they began to reduce their dependence on what they saw as an, an increasingly undependable United States. Australia and Chile even flirted with the idea of inviting China into the agreement to take America's place. And before long, the 11 countries decided just to go ahead with the agreement without the US and to drop some of the provisions that the US had insisted on and that agreement, the CPTPP deal, was signed and ratified last year. So now key Asia-Pacific countries have moved ahead without the United States to deepen trade, to deepen investment, to deepen integration, and they are not looking back. There was one tweet uh, last year where it appeared that President Trump was some kind of flirting with the idea that maybe, maybe he'd reconsider TPP. And immediately, the trade minister of Australia um, told the press very bluntly, this deal will not be thrown open to appease the United States. When was the last time you heard an ally, an Australian, talking about appeasing the United States? So today, there is a trade bloc in Asia Pacific with half a billion people representing almost 15% of the global economy with high standard provisions on the digital economy, on investment, on financial services, on the environment that does not include China and does not include the United States. Wow. So I've described a trend towards these kinds of coping behaviors, de de deference, duality, diversification. And I'm not for a moment suggesting it's an either or proposition. They're not mutually exclusive. Virtually all Asian governments find it prudent to at times accommodate China, to balance relations between Beijing and Washington, or to insulate themselves through new relationships with peers. And I'm not suggesting that there aren't instances of these behaviors that long precede Donald Trump and Xi Jinping. But what I am saying is that the new reality in the Asia Pacific region is one of diminished reliance on the United States and greater accommodation of Chinese policies and priorities. The United States is no longer assured pride of place there's no guarantee that the US is the preeminent influential power. And the next president, whatever her or his commitment will be to engagement, to universal values, to international norms, to the Asia Pacific region, the next US president is going to encounter a profoundly changed landscape in the Indo-Pacific that's not just going to snap back to the old model of 
American dominance or ascendancy. Because Asian countries can't unsee what they've seen. They can't unlearn the experiences of recent years. They're not going to take apart the arrangements that they've made, the institutions that they've developed to cope with the, these twin currents of a formidable China and a diminished America. The compromises and the concessions that these countries have made with China, going along to get along, will not be easily rescinded. The residue of mistrust that's accumulated can't just be flushed out of the system. So America will have to live with the adaptations underway in Asia, and America has to cope with the fact that those adaptations are not advantageous to the US and they're not advantageous to liberal democratic values. Where Washington could once expect easily to rally support from most of the region on range of issues, increasingly we're going to have to negotiate from a standing start. We're gonna to have to contend with a stronger China, with less cooperative partners, with more independent regional institutions. The center of rule setting in the region is certain to shift with greater Chinese activism and with the expansion of these forums and institutions where the US doesn't lead, doesn't show up, and in some cases doesn't even participate. For US business, this would mean regional rules and standards that are set without reference to our interests. It means diminished market access. It means more structural impediments in sectors where US firms ought to be competitive. For the US military, for national security interests, it means diminished support for US bases, for access, for joint operations, exercises. It means reduced interoperability as regional partners look elsewhere for arms procurement. For American diplomatic and intelligence communities, it means dealing with partners that are more reluctant to take risks on America's behalf, more reluctant to share information with us, not knowing what we will do with it. And for Western journalists and academics and civil society, it means more risk more restrictions, more barriers, diminished access. And for universal values and freedoms that are crucial to a free and open region, it means weakened support for human rights and for the rule of law. The net effect of a diminishment of American leadership, an erosion of our ability to elicit support or compliance without coercion, without bullying, and an erosion of our capacity to exert influence on the regional stage or on the global stage to set rules or to enforce them. This is not good, folks. Now, I know this sounds, sounds pretty dark, <laughs> and I don't mean to suggest, as I said before, that the Chinese are masterminds, uh, we know that China can be its own worst enemy. Beijing's propensity to overreach can serve as a break on, regional, on its regional influence. But even for that to happen requires ultimately that the US appears credible as a counterweight in Beijing's eyes and in the eyes of other countries in the region. We can also consider, just as a possibility, that the Trump administration's confrontational trade policies and technology policies could force fundamental changes in China's behavior, positive changes in China's behavior. But since the collapse of the trade talks, since the reimposition of tariffs, we've seen the Chinese position harden, not soften. And in any case, I don't think anyone who knows China believes or ever believed that China could be bullied 
into making structural changes, let alone changes that might weaken Communist Party control. Or, just for the sake of argument, what if uh, China's national economy, which is already struggling under various societal time bombs like aging population, pollution, debt, water security, what if China's economy faltered under the pressure of President Trump's tariffs and decoupling and technology? This certainly seems to be the objective of some of his advisors. What would happen then? I don't know. And I don't want to find out. Because I heard and agree with President Obama say again and again that he was not afraid of a strong, thriving, prosperous China. He was worried about a faltering, unstable, insecure China. So where does that leave us? My experience, and I'm sure Susan's experience as a diplomat, uh, and certainly uh, this reflects Bob Ellsworth's life, is that America has derived immense power from the multiplier effect. That others joined with us believing that we stood for something greater than ourselves. But by conditioning foreign partners to rely on us less, we're not saving the taxpayers money. We're not putting America first. We are squandering our greatest strength. The good news is that most countries in the region still recognize and admire America's great strengths. The US economy remains dynamic, it's enormous. US brands have tremendous appeal. Silicon Valley generates innovative new products and industries, American technology, American investment. It's high quality, it's, it's widely welcomed. And most, nearly all countries in the region want the United States to actively engage in Asia, if only to provide some balance and some options. The specter of a muscular regional power, China, actually burnishes America's appeal and feeds the region's appetite for a countervailing force, a peaceful countervailing force. It's just that we should harbor no illusions that the Asia that we come back to when we pivot again, when we rebalance, will be the same region that we seem to have left. Winning back a greater degree of trust and influence and credibility in an altered Asia Pacific region will not be easy, but it's vital that we try. So I don't know what the formula is for reclaiming lost leadership. It's more kind of alchemy and magic than science. Um, but I will offer my view on how I think Asians will judge the credibility of a future administration that, that tries. First, they'll be looking for indicators that we've gotten our own act together. Evidence that the government is functional, that our economy is sound and stable, that we retain our military edge without waging new wars. And I think they will look for evidence that the US can coexist and deal effectively and constructively with China. Second, I think that they will be looking for what Lee Kuan Yew called the black box of American resilience, the ceaseless innovation, dynamic entrepreneurship, companies and universities that attract the best minds, and immigration policies designed to admit them and to retain them. I think that they will be looking for steadiness in American commitment to principles. Trust me, this is not to say that governments in Asia want to be hectored and lectured over human rights. But they hate uncertainty. And they want to know what America stands for. 
they'll be looking for evidence that we give a hoot, that we care. And this starts with the truism that 80% of life is, is showing up. That means staffing our embassies. That means high-level participation in meetings. Uh, might not hurt to get another assistant secretary of state for East Asia. But beyond that, it's evidence of America's willingness to take their interests into account. After all, leadership is a function of other people choosing to align themselves with you based on their confidence that you recognize and respect their interests and that you are capable of respecting them and protecting them. So the bottom line is this. In the face of China's size and proximity, its escalating checkbook diplomacy, its muscular assertiveness, its confident multilateralism, Asian countries are yearning for American engagement and reliability, but they are not waiting around for it. There is a process of structural diversification underway right now that significantly impacts US interests in the long term. And it means that the next administration, regardless of party, regardless of policy, will face a more challenging environment in this high stakes region. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, that was a really uh, very masterful and very depressing <laughs> uh, talk. Um, because if you think back to the start of the Obama administration, even then, the reason why we thought we needed a rebalancing effort, the pivot, whatever you want to call it, was that we felt that American engagement in Asia had just kind of secularly over time uh, diminished, maybe because of the gravity of Chinese growth, um, but also our own attention to uh, terrorism in the Middle East and other problems. So, and that was without being preceded by something like the Trump administration now. Um, and of course, the US is uh, far away from mainland Asia, and so we always have the tyranny of distance problem, getting our diplomats out there. So, um, uh, it is really a daunting prospect to think about how you would rebuild um, an actively involved United States. So do you, um, I guess I'll start with one specific question that has really uh, interested me for a long time, which is do you, how do you assess the impact of Chinese uh, coercive use of its market power on other countries? You know, of course, we also impose sanctions sometimes and do things like that. But, but I think uh, China really sets a new record for uh, coercively pressuring uh, countries like Korea, the Philippines, Norway, um, the UK, over, sometimes over issues that are basically domestic political issues in China, like Tibet, Xinjiang, or Taiwan. 
So do you think that actually that's working to make other Asian countries more differential? Or do you think that they are paying some price for that in their relations with other countries? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so by that I mean that uh, it is a mixed bag and I think that we see uh, China experimenting with different types and different uh, orders of magnitude in harnessing their uh, economic leverage and the power of their markets uh, to their political agenda. I'd say overall, uh, when it is used with some restraint, it appears to be pretty effective. Uh, I think that the Chinese sort of carrot and stick uh, is an inducement to a number of, uh, to quite a few countries, not only in the Asia Pacific region, uh, but in Europe and elsewhere, to uh, tiptoe around issues where the Chinese have particular political sensitivities. And guess what? That's not limited to uh, countries. You see companies as well that are willing to be deferential to the point of. Uh, redrawing maps to include Taiwan as part of China and to revise uh, language in brochures and so on and so forth. Um, so you can't say that it doesn't have an effect. Uh, at a bigger level though, in the areas and the instances where China has experimented with uh, really tough and uh, pointed economic retaliation, uh, there are cases where it has backfired. Nowhere more so than when in 2012 or 2013, China, uh, furious at the Japanese, uh, abruptly cut off the uh, sale of rare earths to Japan. That had the unintended uh, effect of causing Japan, the US, uh, Europe, and others to begin uh, looking for alternative sources, including Mongolia and elsewhere, to diversify the supply chain. And it also led to a WTO case brought by uh, the EU, Japan, and the US very first time uh, that ultimately China lost. This is a way, by the way, an, uh, sort of a corollary to the risk and the dangers that we're seeing in decoupling, where uh, by withholding uh, semiconductors from ZTE and so on, we are incentivizing the Chinese to diversify away from the U.S. supply chain uh, and to find And allies and friends, too. And allies and friends, yes, as I've said. I mean... Um... So, uh, in that instance, in uh, the case of Norway, and uh, in the case of the Lotte, uh, boycott as retaliation for the South Korean government's assent to the deployment of a anti-ballistic missile THAAD uh, defense system. Um, and in the case of the Philippines, uh, where the punishment against the Aquino government for uh, taking the issue of the South China Sea Islands to the law of the sea tribunal was that Philippine fruit and bananas rotted on the docks uh, in China and Chinese tourists stopped going, et cetera. There were real financial consequences. But in none of those cases did China achieve its objective. Uh, China, as far as I know, hasn't in a big way been able to use the stick of uh, economic punishment to successfully change the particular behavior. And frankly, that gets really at what to me is the heart of the, uh, of the, the fallacy in the current US policy towards China, which is that it does not appear to be engineered to actually change the behavior that the US is objecting to. Uh, we did not reach an agreement on trade that might have created more market access when lack of market access is something that we complain about. Uh, we haven't uh, 
no matter how much we vilified and yelled at the Chinese, uh, we haven't altered their uh, behavior towards the Uyghurs in Xinjiang or to the islands in the South China Sea or to, uh, frankly, cyber theft of economic information, which had been reduced and is now resurgent. Uh, so the, to me, the cold-blooded and important question is, does this policy achieve real benefits? And I think the Chinese can benefit from some reflection when it comes to economic leverage. So can the United States. OK, what do you think Huawei has become and uh, 5G have become kind of the focal point of the new strategic rivalry between the UN United States and China? And the United States has, uh, has set the goal of trying to get other countries to exclude Huawei from their 5G infrastructure. So looking at China's approximately 20 Asian neighbors, how do you think that's going to work out? Um, because we are yeah. now kind of saying you've got to choose. So of course, nobody wants to have to choose. So how do you think that's going to work out? I mean, and can you say something maybe specifically about particular countries? Well, a large share of the developing world uh, in Africa, in uh, South America, and in uh, Asia, South Asia and East Asia, uh, is heavily, heavily invested in Huawei equipment and Huawei phones. And it's an immensely successful company. Uh, particularly in the developing world. And it will be extraordinarily difficult uh, for the United States to sort of budge those countries out of the Huawei camp. Now, the United States can create huge problems, practical problems, production problems, and is creating those problems for Huawei by uh, denying them access to critical components, to withholding the intellectual property and the patents that derive from US sources, even though they're going through uh, third country companies, et cetera. Um, and you know, this presents very serious problems for uh, Huawei. But I'm not a football person, but I do know this. You can't win on defense alone. Blocking Huawei. Telling people just say no <laughs> doesn't work. Um, and there are two things that the United States needs to do in order to have a successful and effective uh, strategy above the basic common sense protections of various national systems, secrets, and supply chains. Um, one is to be able to put forward an alternative. And there are few, or and there are no American alternatives in okay. 5G, and few alternatives to Huawei in much of the world. Um, but second, uh, the United States needs to be able to uh, work with the Chinese, and work with Huawei, and work with partners to figure out what is a solution. Now, I my approach views and attitudes towards China has been pretty consistent over the years. And somehow or another, I went from being one of the toughest people on China in the US government sure. to being a card-carrying panda hugger. And <laughs> I didn't move. Everybody else moved. I didn't move. Um, but I, I, so I, I'm not soft on China. But you saw how they sometimes have this pragmatic gene where they'll adjust to reduce the cost to themselves. Yes. And uh, my Chinese friends and former counterparts say to me, and I have to admit that there is some justice to it, we don't see the United States aiming for a solution. You are picking up these problems and 
beating us with them like they're sticks. But you're not working with us to figure out a compromise or a way forward. There is a conceit in the US government in some quarters and among many people in Washington that engagement didn't work, that it's pointless to negotiate with the Chinese, that negotiating is a Chinese trick. It's like a, those finger traps and you go back and forth and you can spend the rest of your life in negotiations with the Chinese but nothing ever happens. Guess what? That's not true and the facts don't support it. We negotiated a profound deal on climate change. What was the magic secret sauce that made that possible? It included things and was built on something that China cared very much about, which was reducing pollution. We made agreements on Iran. We made agreements on uh, what military ships at sea, when they encounter each other, should do. We made agreements on notification on exercises, on visa validity, on, on all kinds of issues. It can be done. And as I, I believe the Communist Party was still in power then, right? Somehow or another, <laughs> they, yes, they, they managed. Uh, yes, it was the same group of people. Right. So uh, I have no illusions about it being easy. Um, I have found it uh, frustrating. That's why I have no hair left. <laughs> dealing, negotiating with Chinese counterparts. And I don't claim to have been su very successful in persuading the Chinese to give more uh, space, international space and, and respect to Taiwan, right. to uh, be more tolerant of religious minorities uh, in and around China, to allow US journalists uh, access in China roughly equivalent to what they enjoy in what Chinese uh, media enjoy in the West. I didn't make a lot of headway in the argument against re reclaiming or, or building or militarizing the outposts in the South China Sea. But there is no way to get where we want to go that doesn't include talking to the Chinese. And right now, there are virtually none of the, tr of the normal institutional mechanisms for uh, exchanging ideas, positions, and offering solutions. Right. Plug for our task force report, course correction, Asia Society and 21st Century China Center. It's on the website, and one of the main points is uh, uh, pushing back is not a strategy, and that you have to negotiate the differences, and it can be done. Okay, we're gonna open it up to the floor. Lots to talk about. Um, so let's start back here. Yes. Please identify yourself when you ask a question. Sure. Uh, my name is Siddharth. I'm a PhD student in UC San Diego. Thank you, sir, for your great talk. It was very insightful. Uh, I just want to take your arguments a little further. Uh, so some scholars and American diplomats, like Henry Kissinger, have written about the world order that was instituted by the Beast of Westphalia, uh, which made the world a multipolar place. Uh, in the past, uh, for like, I would like to ask that it remained multipolar or bipolar for most of past few centuries. Um, but after the 2008 uh, financial breakdown and the rise of China, is it again becoming a multipolar world after US hegemony, uh, like after the end of Cold War to 2008, it was unipolar. Are we again looking at a multipolar world or a bipolar world where China's GDP is much more higher than uh, Japan and Germany, the third and fourth highest GDP countries? And are we again uh, looking at a reshaping, so to say, of the world order, uh, kind of like Asia getting more uh, power than Europe and America combined? Okay, so the question is, are we now uh, entering a period of a multipolar world or a bipolar world. So how do you see that? Um, I'm a practitioner of <laughs> diplomacy and international relations, uh, a kind of field hand, uh, not a brilliant uh, theorist like Henry Kissinger. 
And so I am less tempted to try to slap a label on the era, knowing as I do that eras come and go. Uh, without a doubt, the relative share of American wealth and power has diminished since the end of the Second World War. And you know what? That's a great thing. It's one of the things about being an American that I am most proud of. Because it's rooted in the principle that it is better to uh, be a well-off member of a wealthy and healthy world than to be a filthy rich member of an impoverished one. And it was that mindset that enabled the economic recovery of Europe and of Japan and then of the Tigers and created an environment in which the Chinese people, by dint of hard work and other uh, virtues, uh, have become very, very successful. Um, so yes, the world is changing. Yes, China's uh, wealth, strength, national power has expanded. Um, but to me, the shortcoming in uh, applying the labels of, bi of bipolar or of multipolar is that it diverts our attention from what's really important. It's, the question isn't who's on top. The question isn't whose share is greater than the other. The question is, what are the principles that are going to guide us collectively in making decisions on questions that affect planet Earth? How are we going to reconcile um, both common and competing interests? What, what, what is the theory of the case here? And right now, we have very different political ideologies. We have. Uh, unfortunately, a real uh, full-scale estrangement uh, between China and <clears throat> the United States. But we know from experience that it does not have to be that way. When you look at the trajectory of China and how China has operated within the global system from Mao uh, through Deng Xiaoping through Jiang Zemin, uh, Hu Jintao, and, and today, um, you see a pretty encouraging story of movement. Now, there's a lot to complain about. There's a lot of backsliding in the last few years under Xi Jinping, particularly when it comes to um, political space and rulemaking. But fundamentally, you don't have the Chinese, or you haven't had the Chinese here, heretofore, uh, arguing that it's my way or no way. Uh, the Chinese have, uh, have thus far agreed uh, to work in a common system. So what's not to like about that? Uh, the task at hand is figuring out not how many poles the world will have, but figuring out what the guiding principles, the priorities, and the objectives of the world will be. And to do that, it's not only the big countries that get a vote. The, in, early in the Obama administration, there was a raging debate about whether the US should join the ASEAN-led East Asia Summit. It's a leaders meeting that convoked at least once a year in East Asia. There's a lot of boring talk about development and... Malaysia uh, was the most enthusiastic, I think, at creating it, right? Oh, yeah. Malaysia was one of the founders. Um, and there was a real debate within the Obama administration because the value of the president's time, uh, the, the uh, kind of horrid Long uh, trip. agenda, yes, um, you know, made some people ask, like, is this really worth it? Do you want to do this? And the president was adamant 
that the answer was yes. And what he said is, we, the United States, benefit disproportionately from an orderly, collaborative region. And so for us to participate in this, if people are already working in developing this institution, these small countries, for us to participate is worth the trip, worth the effort, and I think he was proved right. Okay, uh, another question, Victor. Uh, I'm Victor Wen, a uh, board member of the 21st Century uh, China Center. A um, couple of questions. One is, as U.S.-China relationship uh, continue to deteriorating, where do you see the liquid, uh, equilibrium point is? Uh, be before we said uh, trade is the stabilizer, now the defense minister chi of China in Singapore said uh, uh, from now on the, the military become a stabilizer, which is pretty scary. The second question is... Uh, no, only one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know the, I don't know the answer. Um, it may be that uh, the leaders have to scare themselves into uh, accommodation. Uh, I hope not. I mean, typically, in many, in most bilateral relations, um, strong economic and people-to-people -people ties serve as the ballast that keeps the relationship steady, that keeps the boat from uh, tipping over. And the extent of uh, academic exchange between the US and China, the extent of business uh, uh, and exchange and commerce, uh, the degree to which, whether it's in sports and culture, uh, music and other areas, uh, the US and China have been able to not only get acquainted, but to create common enterprises and so on. Um, those are enterprises that most US, previous US administrations have encouraged with the view to creating that kind of ballast, that kind of steadiness. And so uh, the reciprocal uh, constraints on visas, the obstacles put in place uh, for now student and research exchange, and the atmosphere of suspicion. Uh, if an American gets in trouble in China or the Chinese gets in trouble in America, instead of being treated as the exception to the rule, it's treated as the proof that uh, the other side is somehow mm -hmm. up to no good. So this is a, this is a dangerous and a very destructive uh, trend. The atrophying of the uh, engagements between the governmental institutions that I alluded to, whether it's the strategic and economic dialogue or it's the US-China you know, legal dialogue or any of these hundreds of institutional mechanisms, some many government to government, but some integrating scholars, academics, professionals, and so on. Uh, those have largely been shut down. And so we're reducing in that realm also our, uh, our ballast, so to speak. Now, it, while it's true that there are virulent uh, anti-American hawks in the People's Liberation Army, and it is true that there are virulent anti-Chinese, anti-China hawks in the US military, my experience is fundamentally uh, professional militaries see as their mission preventing war. Sounds counterintuitive, but that has been my experience. And these, generally speaking, are people, particularly on the US side, who have a healthy appreciation of how easy it is to get into combat, to get into war. And 
they don't want to do it if they don't have to. Now, if they have to, they, they want to be ready to win, but that's another story. So it's, in that sense, not so surprising that uh, the Chinese defense minister and the acting US uh, defense secretary, Shannon, in Shangri-La uh, should have had a constructive engagement and spoken about providing the stability in the relationship. Uh, but I agree with you that it's a sorry day when that is kind of our, our last uh, hope for balance in the relationship. Okay. No, no women. No, yeah, exactly. I, th I think the American uh, concerns, the biggest ones, are uh, the uh, transfer of technologies when there's production in China and kind of the expansionist tendencies. And uh, I, I know a... Um, a father of a friend who was a CEO of a major company, and they pulled out of China. And Erwin Jacobs, a year ago in a, in a conversation here, talked about the fact that uh, they didn't want to okay his chips because they were really trying to uh, steal the Well, he didn't say it in that many words, but he, he alluded to the fact that they only it was only the fact that he didn't uh, that they couldn't do it fast enough that they finally uh, bought his chips instead of manufactured it themselves. So, uh, and, and I produce television programming that airs both here in the could U.S. You, I'm sorry, and China. could you get to the question? Yeah, but, but when you look at, how, how do you, how do you uh, suggest constraining, uh, not constraining, but, but uh, making sure that China doesn't, as they get stronger, want to expand further and further? Well, the expectation that China uh, will continue to get stronger and therefore it is incumbent on uh, the US government to try to bind China into acceptable rules and norms while it's, we still have leverage was really, I think, the guiding principle for the Bush and the Obama administrations, and there are many areas and instances uh, where we did. Um, it's worth remembering that the pathway from uh, uh, low-income country, developing country, middle-income country, uh, invariably includes uh, a certain amount of kleptomania. Uh, and I vividly remember the battles when I first joined government in the, in the 80s uh, with Japan over lack of market access, over intellectual property theft, over piracy, over market, uh, lack of market access, of non-tariff barriers, of currency manipulation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm not giving China an alibi by any uh, means, but this is not unheard of. This is the way it works. And as when th uh, the problems arise, as they arose with Japan in the late 80s, and uh, when the country has reached a point where it starts to become a kind of near peer rival or competitor, and it is perceived as exploiting its technical status as a developing country, or it's still behaving uh, in the old patterns even though it's increasingly successful, et cetera. Um, this is clearly the, the environment that we are in. Um, there are tools, not remedies. I mean, not a, not a single uh, proven solution to problematic behavior. And even a country as uh, con tightly controlled uh, as China is by the Communist Party, uh, while nominally the party may be in charge of everything in practice, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, uncontrolled activity. Um, in some instances, as in copyright protection and so on, uh, there's a natural corrective mechanism as China's own companies start uh, 
valuing the protection of their own intellectual property more than the theft of somebody else's. But fundamentally, it's a matter of reaching agreement on rules, reaching agreement on uh, monitoring and enforcement uh, mechanisms, and giving, ensuring that there is some incentive on the part of, in this case, China and the Chinese authorities, some incentive to enforce them and to do better. Some of it is reputational cost. Some of it is commercial risk. Uh, some of it is pure politics. But it's a project, and that's the point. China is not a problem to be solved. China is a country, and China is an, a necessary partner, as well as a competitor. The problems derive from behavior, and they have to be taken as behaviors one by one. You have to deal with them directly and draw from this suite of diplomatic, economic, political, reputational uh, tools uh, to try to stem the behavior that you oppose. Now, it has certainly been my experience that your chances of success are improved if you as the United States are flanked by the majority of the industrialized world on a given issue in dealing with China. And the disarray among the Western countries, the alienation between Washington and so many European and other capitals uh, dramatically lessens the uh, effect uh, when we try to put pressure on China to amend its behavior. OK, one last quick question, yes. Yes, here. Thank you for your lecture. I'm a student at UCSD. So in the theme of like a new world order being constructed in Eurasia, I just want to ask you the role of Russia on the impact of US-China relationship, either for the deterioration or, or ramification. Because I see Russia as both a threat and also a solution. Threat in the sense that Russia posed direct threat on Europe, our most strategic alliance, which has also started to adopt uh, to the uh, Chinese BRI plan, like Italy and BRI. But also Russia is a solution in the, in the sense that China and Russia shares this perpetual ge geopolitical competition in Russia, which the US can definitely do something about it. But yeah, yeah. So, thank you. OK, well, so <laughs> role, role of Russia, great question. Yeah. Uh, um, I agree that there's something fundamentally unnatural in the Sino-Russian current collaboration, given this geostrategic dynamic where, by rights, Russia ought to be very afraid of uh, China. Uh, but these are abnormal times. I mean, my practical experience is that uh, the role of Russia has, by and large, become one of a spoiler, uh, that uh, Russia is opportunistically looking to exploit uh, problems that the United States has with China and with other countries. Uh, there has been, for the last three or four years, a kind of unspoken, or for all I know, written understanding between uh, Moscow and Beijing that Moscow will back uh, Beijing, particularly in the UN Security Council, on issues pertaining to the Ukraine, issues pertaining to uh, Eurasia that Russia cares particularly about, as well as on Syria and the Middle East and to some extent Iran. And that apparently in return that uh, Russia will back China on North Korea and on a few other issues, while never passing up an opportunity to make some mischief uh, for the United States. Um, I mean, someone invoked Henry Kissinger, who uh, um, more than anyone understood the point that um, there is no circumstance in which Russia and China having a better relationship with each other than each of them have with Washington is a good thing. 
It is not a good thing. And yet, that's where, that's where we are uh, right now. That said, uh, Russia's national strength has withered uh, so significantly, and China's national power has grown so significantly that uh, setting aside certain very specific issues where Russia is active and uh, influential in its immediate uh, periphery, um, it certainly seems to me that if the United States could find uh, a f more effective means of collaboration with China, uh, Russia would be swept along in our slipstream. And in fact, we saw that in 2017 uh, with regard to North Korea policy, where thanks to Kim Jong-un, for a brief moment, the last few months of 2017, uh, China and the United States were making very significant uh, common cause in the UN Security Council and adopting and enforcing sanctions uh, to an mm -hmm. unprecedented level. Russia went along with that essentially without a murmur. And it's worth mentioning that as a result of that effective pressure, North Korea suddenly discovered that it was really in favor of peaceful resolution, negotiation, Olympics, and olive branches, and uh, made a 180 degree turn. Now, unfortunately, uh, that turn uh, didn't work to our advantage, but that's another story. Well, um, I want to thank you so much for giving us uh, so many rich ideas to think about, and I'm sure that everyone here, as you sort of follow Asia in the newspapers, the news, will be really, uh, will have a much deeper understanding of the dynamic that's going on, thanks to what we've learned from you. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Susan. It's a pleasure.